Greetings from beautiful Colorado. My name is Ned Nikolov, and I'm a physical scientist with the U.S. Forest Service. Today, I would like to discuss with you the greenhouse effect, the atmospheric greenhouse effect, what it is and how it works. The statements I'm about to make are coming from research that I conducted on my own time, and therefore do not represent the opinions or official positions of the U.S. Forest Service or any other government agency for that matter. So what is the greenhouse effect? Well, it's a term that uh, simply defines the thermal effect of the atmosphere. It's been known for about 200 years now that the presence of atmosphere makes the surface of a planet or a moon warmer compared to the absence of atmosphere compared to an airless environment when the only source of energy to the surface is the solar radiation. Why it is important to know how the greenhouse effect works? Well, it is because the current radiative greenhouse theory which claims to explain the greenhouse effect is actually at the core of all climate projections in existence. So therefore, uh, it is of uh, crucial importance that we make sure the relative greenhouse theory is physically valid. Because if there are flaws in this theory, or if the fundamental assumptions of, of the theory are incorrect, that would invalidate all climate projections that we currently have. This is a depiction of how the greenhouse effect is thought to work at present. The figure borrowed from the EPA website is also utilized by Wikipedia. It mirrors a similar drawing published in the 2007 IPCC fourth assessment report. According to the current theory, what makes the greenhouse effect possible is the fact that the atmosphere is nearly transparent to sense shortwave radiation, but mostly opaque to the outgoing longwave infrared radiation emitted by the surface. The following mechanism has been assumed to be true for over 100 years. Solar radiation reaching the Earth's upper atmosphere splits into two fluxes, one reflected by clouds on the surface, which is energy lost to the climate system, and another absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere system that fuels the climate. About a third of the absorbed solar flux is captured directly by the atmosphere, while two-thirds of it hits the surface. In order to balance the absorbed solar flux, the surface, having a much lower temperature than the sun, emits long-wave radiation. Some of this radiation passes straight through the atmosphere via the so-called atmospheric window, located between 8 and 14 micrometer of wavelength. But most of the outgoing long-wave flux is absorbed by greenhouse gases such as water vapor, CO2, and ozone, and re-emitted in all directions, including towards the surface. The effect of this is to warm the Earth's surface and the lower troposphere. Hence, the causative driver of the greenhouse effect is believed to be the atmospheric infrared back radiation, often called greenhouse radiation, and viewed as an extra or external source of heat to the surface. This conceptual model of the atmospheric thermal effect is supported by IPCC. For example, we find the following description in the 2007 fourth assessment report. To balance the absorbed incoming energy, the Earth must, on average, radiate the same amount of energy back to space. Because the Earth is much colder than the Sun, it radiates at much longer wavelength, primarily in the infrared part of the spectrum. Much of this thermal radiation emitted by the land and ocean is absorbed by the atmosphere, including clouds, and re-radiated back to Earth. This is called the greenhouse effect. The notion that absorption and the re-emission of outgoing terrestrial radiation by trace gases causes heat to be trapped in the troposphere is postulated in numerous scientific publications, some of which are used as teaching manuals for students, such as this book by Daniel Jacob, a professor of atmospheric chemistry and environmental engineering at Harvard University. Chapter 7 of this book describes the greenhouse effect as follows. To balance this input of solar radiation, the Earth itself emits radiation to space. Some of this terrestrial radiation is trapped by greenhouse gases and radiated back to the Earth, resulting in the warming of the surface known as the greenhouse effect. As we will see, trapping of terrestrial radiation by naturally occurring greenhouse gases is essential for maintaining the Earth's surface temperature above the freezing point. End of quote. The conjecture expressed by Joseph Fourier in 1827 
that the atmosphere warms the Earth's surface by acting as an insulator and preventing heat from escaping to space has become a fundamental tenet of the modern climate theory. For example, Dr. Ray Perehumbert, a professor of physics at Oxford University, stated in a 2011 paper that the greenhouse effect works just like fiberglass insulation or low emissivity windows reduce the heat loss from a home. As we'll see later, this explanation is physically totally incorrect. So, to sum up, according to the current unanimously accepted climate theory, the greenhouse effect is a radiative phenomenon caused by heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere that are assumed to reduce the rate of surface infrared cooling to space by absorbing outgoing long-wave radiation and re-emitting part of it back, thus increasing the total energy flux towards the surface. Now that we've overviewed the basic tenets of the radiative greenhouse theory, let's analyze them in the light of known fundamental physical laws and modern satellite observations. We begin with a theoretical question. Can the atmospheric infrared back radiation warm the Earth's surface beyond a temperature set by the solar heating? If most atmospheric long-wave radiation is due to radiant heat emitted by the surface, as depicted on this drawing by the looping arrow in the lower right corner, this implies that the Earth basically raises its temperature by reabsorbing a portion of its own infrared emission. However, such a self-heating mechanism violates the second law of thermodynamics, hence it cannot be real. To fully grasp the issue, it is important to understand the difference between the reflection and the re-radiation of infrared energy. Reflection entails no energy absorption and no change in spectral characteristics of the backscattered light. Reflected radiation does not affect the temperature of a reflecting body. Re-radiation, on the other hand, involves absorption of radiant energy by a material body at frequencies of the incoming flux and emission of infrared radiation by the body at frequencies and intensity depending on the body's absolute temperature. Since the temperature of an absorbing body is controlled not just by radiative transfer but other heat exchange processes as well, such as conduction and convection, the process of re-radiation changes both the size and the spectral characteristics of an outgoing infrared flux. Atmospheric gases cannot reflect infrared radiation. They can only re-radiate thermal emissions. That's because they are either transparent to or absorptive of particular infrared spectral bands. Furthermore, according to the Kirchhoff's law, infrared absorptivity of a body equals its infrared emissivity. Thus, substances of high infrared absorptivity, such as water vapor and CO2, do not trap radiant heat, but instead promote radiative cooling. Only materials of very low infrared absorptivity and correspondingly high infrared reflectivity, such as aluminum and silver, can trap radiant heat by reflecting electromagnetic long-wave radiation back to the source. These materials, known in thermal engineering as radiant barriers, possess infrared radiative properties that are opposite to those of the so-called greenhouse gases. Therefore, in order for an atmosphere to trap radiant heat, it must reflect infrared radiation back to the surface, which is not occurring in reality. As a result of all this, the Earth's surface, which is a part of an open system, cannot in principle increase its temperature by absorbing infrared radiation from the atmosphere heated by the surface on infrared emission. As an extreme example of this principle, consider a campfire radiating infrared flux that heats the skin and claws of people sitting around it. This increases the infrared emission from the camper's bodies in all directions, including towards the fire. However, this heightened thermal emission does not affect the temperature of the fire. The greenhouse concept essentially claims that the thermal radiation emitted by people sitting around a campfire can increase the temperature of the fire itself, which is thermodynamically absurd. Confusing re-radiation with reflection is a common mistake made even by climate scientists when discussing the greenhouse effect. We now direct our attention towards quantitative estimates of Earth's energy budget that contradict fundamental premises of the radiative greenhouse theory. 
This figure is from the IPCC fifth assessment report. It shows globally average shortwave and longwave energy fluxes computed from measurements provided by surface and satellite monitoring systems. Solar fluxes are depicted by yellow arrows, while longwave infrared radiation is represented by orange arrows. Note that the Earth atmosphere system as a whole absorbs 240 watts per square meter of solar radiation, calculated by subtracting the reflected flux of 100 watts per square meter from the above cloud insulation of 340 watts per square meter. Yet the observed longwave fluxes at the surface are significantly larger. 342 watts per square meter of downrolling infrared back radiation and 398 watts per square meter of outgoing surface radiation. At the top of the atmosphere, the outgoing longwave flux nearly balances the absorbed solar flux. Considering that these are real data, a question arises. How does a 240 watts per square meter absorbed solar flux get amplified to more than 340 watts per square meter longwave fluxes at the surface without violating the energy conservation law, also known as the, law, as the first law of thermodynamics. The greenhouse theory is typically silent about this question, but when pressed for an explanation, it attributes the enhanced infrared fluxes at the bottom of the atmosphere to a repeated absorption and re-emission of uh, radiant heat by greenhouse gases and the Earth's surface. However, this explanation violates the energy conservation law because, as we pointed out earlier, the process of internal absorption and radiation of infrared energy among system components does not lead to trapping of heat and therefore cannot increase the internal kinetic energy of the system needed to account for the larger near-surface thermal fluxes. Heat trapping is physically impossible in an open system such as a planetary atmosphere where gas volume is not constrained and the dominant mode of heat transport is an uninhibited fluid motion in the form of convection, advection, and pervection, which is infrasound waves. Some scientists try to dodge this issue by emphasizing that the radiative fluxes shown in the IPCC figure balance out. However, the question is not about balance, but how to explain the transformation of 240 watts per square meter absorbed solar radiation into 340 plus watts per square meter long wave fluxes near the surface without violating physical laws. Here is a layman's example that illustrates the problem. Picture yourself having $240 that you split between two bank accounts. You deposit $79 in one account and $161 in the other. You then start quickly transferring funds between the accounts, whereby you lose $5 in fees for each transaction. Can you reasonably expect to increase your money to $342 in one account and $398 in the other account after X number of transactions? The answer is self-evident, of course not. Hence, the explanation provided by the radiative greenhouse concept for the large downwelling atmospheric infrared flux must be wrong. This flux is not a result of the absorption and re-emission of outgoing terrestrial radiation by greenhouse gases. Another problem with significant implications for the radiative greenhouse theory is the underestimation of Earth's atmospheric thermal effect. For over 50 years, it's been believed that the presence of an atmosphere boosts Earth's global average temperature by 18 to 33 degrees due to a radiative forcing by greenhouse trace gases. Most researchers subscribe to the 33 degree greenhouse effect. However, a study published in 2014 revealed that these estimates were based on a mathematically incorrect formula for calculating the Earth's global surface temperature in the absence of an atmosphere. Conceptually, the issue is that the strength of the greenhouse effect has been evaluated by comparing an observed spherically average global surface temperature to a modeled abstract temperature of a flat disk. This study derived a correct general formula for computing the global average temperatures of airless bodies via spherical integration of the Stefan Boltzmann radiation law. The new formula was successfully verified against NASA temperature data for the Moon. The study found that the true thermal effect of Earth's atmosphere is about 90 degrees Celsius, or 2.7 times stronger than previously thought. This finding presents additional challenges to the greenhouse theory because a 90-degree thermal effect cannot be explained by known 
radiation budgets of Earth. The 2014 paper also showed that, first, the Moon is a perfect natural airless equivalent of Earth. Second, the effective radiating temperature of a planet, T sub E, used by mainstream science to calculate the greenhouse effect is a non-physical quantity that should not be compared to any atmospheric or surface kinetic temperatures. And third, the no-atmosphere temperature of a spherical body, T sub Na, is always lower than the effective radiating temperature, which explains the new estimate of a much stronger atmospheric thermal effect. We now return to the Earth's energy budget diagram to discuss definitions of the greenhouse effect. The peer-reviewed literature formally defines the greenhouse effect as an atmospheric absorption of outgoing long-wave radiation measured as a difference between observed global infrared fluxes of the surface and the top of the atmosphere. The IPCC diagram shows this flux difference in purple. The surface warming caused by the presence of atmosphere currently assumed to be 33 degrees Celsius is considered a consequence of the infrared absorption by greenhouse gases and therefore of secondary importance. This reflects the strong belief in the current climate science that the global surface temperature is controlled by atmospheric infrared long-wave radiation, an idea stemming from the work of Fourier, Tyndall, and Arrhenius in the 19th century. Using this flux-based definition, the Earth's greenhouse effect is estimated according to modern observations at 159 watts per square meter of sort outgoing long-wave radiation by the atmosphere. The problem is that this infrared flux is utterly insufficient to explain the 90-degree atmospheric thermal effect independently derived by Volokhin and Relez using moon temperature data from NASA. Moreover, this flux-based measure yields physically nonsensical results at the Earth's poles. Thus, the greenhouse effect over central Antarctica has been found to be zero or negative by two independent studies published in 2015 and 2018 using a 13-year-long record of satellite observations. Yet, the atmospheric thermal effect over this region estimated as a difference between mean annual surface temperatures of central Antarctica and the south pole of the Moon is about 144 degrees Celsius. This fact indicates that the flux-based definition of the greenhouse effect has no relationship to the actual atmospheric thermal effect experienced by the surface. Such a conclusion is further supported by comparing latitudinal patterns of the absorbed infrared flux and the surface atmospheric thermal effect. On this slide, figure 1 shows latitudinal variation of the greenhouse effect according to the infrared flux-based definition derived from satellite data by Song et al. 2016. Figure 2a depicts the mean latitudinal surface temperature profiles of Mother Earth and the Moon. Moon's surface temperatures came from NASA diviner measurements and thermophysical models. Figure 2b portrays the meridional variation of the atmospheric thermal effect calculated as a difference between Earth's and Moon's average latitudinal surface temperatures. Comparing figure 2b to figure 1 makes it clear that the atmospheric thermal effect follows an opposite spatial pattern to that of the flux-based greenhouse effect. The atmospheric thermal effect is smallest in the tropics and largest at the poles, while the greenhouse effect is largest at the equator and smallest at the poles. Hence, the infrared flux-based measure of the greenhouse effect does not describe the actual surface thermal enhancement due to the presence of atmosphere. In other words, the atmospheric absorption of outgoing infrared radiation appears to have no relevance to surface temperatures. This slide compares latitudinal variations of the infrared back radiation, also known as greenhouse radiation, and the atmospheric thermal effect estimated using the method described earlier. As with the flux-based definition of the greenhouse effect, we find that the infrared back radiation follows an opposite spatial pattern to that of the atmospheric thermal effect. Compare figures 1 and 2b. This indicates that the atmospheric downwelling long-wave radiation is not a driver of the surface warming attributed to the presence of an atmosphere. Hence, there must be another mechanism controlling the atmospheric thermal effect. We'll see what it is later in this presentation. When discussing the natural greenhouse effect, it is important to explain how the increase of atmospheric CO2 due to human industrial activities is believed to warm the Earth's surface according to the current climate theory. Such a warming is often referred to in the scientific literature as enhanced greenhouse effect. 
or EGE. This diagram illustrates the assumed EGE mechanism, which is poorly known even to some scientists, while most members of the general public have probably never heard of it. The diagram shows temperature on the horizontal axis and altitude above ground on the vertical axis. The sloped lines depict a decrease of air temperature with altitude, which is known as environmental adiabatic lapse rate, approximately equal to minus 6 degrees Celsius per kilometer. T sub E is the effective radiating temperature of Earth, a parameter calculated from the average absorbed solar radiation by the planet using a simple form of the Stefan Boltzmann radiation law, which treats Earth as an isothermal flat disk. T sub S is the average global surface temperature of Earth. The altitude in the troposphere where the atmospheric temperature equals T sub E is known as effective radiating altitude and it is assumed to be the source of most Earth's outgoing long-wave radiation to space. The greenhouse theory claims that rising concentrations of atmospheric CO2 and other greenhouse gases increase atmospheric opacity or reduce atmospheric transparency to infrared long-wave radiation and that this shifts Earth's radiating altitude upward without changing the radiating temperature. As a result, the lapse rate gets now to be applied over a longer distance as shown by the double CO2 line on the diagram. This boosts the surface temperature by delta T sub S. Thus, according to the greenhouse concept, adding CO2 warms the surface by modifying the lapse rate geometry, which is odd since this mechanism does not involve any diabatic or adiabatic processes required by standard physics to change the temperature of a material object. Before analyzing the EG mechanism, let's listen to Professor Ray Perehumbert, who explains it in layman's terms. Dr. Perehumbert is a leading climate scientist with a long publication record. He is the author of a now famous textbook for graduate students entitled Principles of Planetary Climate that was published in 2010. The following is an excerpt from an interview conducted in 2013. So the other part of the equation that determines the temperature of a planet is the rate at which you lose energy. And here the key insight, which was already known to Fourier but not quantified yet, was that the hotter a body gets, the more rapidly it loses energy. And so you're receiving energy at more or less a fixed rate from the sun, and then the temperature builds up and builds up and builds up. The hotter it gets, the more rapidly you lose energy to space by infrared radiation, and then bang, when, you, when what goes out, equals what comes in, that's your equilibrium temperature. And that is called a radiating temperature of the planet. And so the radiating temperature of the Earth might be something like minus 20 Celsius, even though the surface temperature uh, is, is a lot higher than that. Uh, and that difference between the radiating temperature, which is something you measure from satellites and can confirm, that difference between the radiating temperature and the surface temperature is accounted for by greenhouse gases. When we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we are not primarily changing the radiating temperature. What we're changing is the radiating altitude, the radiating level, so that the atmosphere is radiating to space from a higher altitude than it used to be, so that the temperature at the radiating level, which is still, let's say, minus 20, remains at minus 20, but, it's, but that temperature is occurring higher up. And since the, the temperature or the rate of temperature increase as you go deeper in the atmosphere is approximately fixed. But you're starting at that minus 20 from higher up. By the time you extrapolate to the ground, you wind up with a higher temperature. And that's a slight oversimplification because that temperature rate of increase is not precisely fixed, but it's close enough to, to the way the situation actually works. But it is essential to recognize that the greenhouse effect can only work if there is cold air up there. Uh, in order for the greenhouse gas increase. In order for increase of carbon dioxide to, uh, to retard the rate of energy loss from a planet, uh, there has to be some place colder than the surface for the planet to radiate. And that, and that relies on the temperature decrease with altitude. Uh, in the Earth regime, that temperature decrease with altitude is primarily caused by convection, by this continual buoyancy-driven stirring from the fact that the ground is hot and then it has to communicate its heat upward by, by warm air rising. It's that convection, stirring things, that primarily determines how cold it is higher up. On the average, temperature goes down 
about six degrees with each kilometer that you go up. In some places, it's a little bit different. Some places, a little bit more, a little bit less. But, about, uh, but a good round number is about six degrees for each kilometer you go up. And so remembering that the radiating temperature stays the same and that, and that adding a greenhouse gas warms the surface by uh, pushing that radiating level higher up in the atmosphere, we can ask the question, how, much, how high do we have to push it? How much higher do we have to push that level in order to get, say, a two degree warming at the surface? Well, to get a six degree warming, we, given that the temperature gradient is six degrees per kilometer, you would push that radiating level up by one kilometer uh, to get a six degree warming at the surface. To get a two degree warming at the surface, you only need to push it up about a third that much, which is in round numbers, 300 meters. And so it takes relatively little increase in the infrared murkiness of the atmosphere to uh, change the uh, altitude uh, at which infrared escapes to space by a mere 300 meters. And that's, that's part of why the climate is so sensitive to greenhouse gas concentrations. To summarize, adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere is supposed to warm the surface by pushing the Earth's radiating altitude higher up in the troposphere. However, according to standard atmospheric thermodynamics, increasing the temperature of a gaseous layer such as the lower troposphere requires one of two types of processes. Either diabetic heating, which is adding thermal energy from an external source, or adiabatic compression, which is increasing the internal gas pressure with no transfer of heat from the surrounding environment. The proposed EG mechanism does not conform to either process since it is simply based on a geometric manipulation of the distance over which the temperature lapse rate is being applied. Hence, it is questionable from a standpoint of fundamental principles whether such a mechanism is physically real. Indeed, there are two major problems with this mechanism. First, the radiating altitude is defined as a height in the troposphere where the observed air temperature matches the effective radiating temperature of the planet, vis the latter is calculated from the measured average solar flux absorbed by the Earth atmosphere system, which is about 240 watts per square meter, employing a simple form of the Stefan Boltzmann radiation law that is only applicable to isothermal surfaces. Hence, contrary to the statement made by Professor Pierre Humbert, T sub E is not measured from satellites, but is rather estimated from an incorrectly applied theory since the surface or the horizontal atmospheric layers of Earth are not isothermal. Volokhin and Roulette 2014 demonstrated that due to nonlinearities involved, the radiating temperature is mathematically incompatible with any kinetic temperatures measured in the atmosphere or at the surface of Earth. Since T sub E represents the temperature of an isothermal disk, it is an abstract mathematical quantity that has no physical relationship to measured temperatures on a spherical body such as Earth. For example, the effective radiating temperature of the Moon is 270.1 Kelvin, a value which does not occur as an annual mean at any lunar latitude. Even the lunar equator, Moon's warmest latitude, has a mean annual temperature of only 213 Kelvin according to infrared measurements by the NASA Diviner Project. Also, the Moon's average global surface temperature is 197.3 Kelvin, which is about 73 Kelvin cooler than the T sub E calculated for the Moon. If the radiating temperature identified an atmospheric layer where most outgoing infrared radiation originates from, as claimed by the greenhouse theory, then the Moon's average long-wave flux should have come from a layer that is more than a meter deep under the surface where the annual temperature approaches 270 Kelvin, which of course makes no physical sense. This shows that T sub E has no physical reality. Therefore, the claimed radiating altitude of Earth is not real either. As a matter of fact, the outgoing infrared long-wave radiation measured at the top of the Earth's atmosphere originates in a continuum from various depths of the troposphere down to the surface. The second problem with the proposed EG mechanism is that the assumed rising of a tropospheric temperature level due to an increased infrared murkiness of the air, as described by Professor Pierre Humbert, is completely at odds with standard atmospheric thermodynamics. In the real atmosphere, vertical temperature variations are closely related to changes of air pressure with altitude. 
This relationship fundamentally stems from the ideal gas law, which describes the state of any gas mixture under most conditions. This slide shows the two most common forms of the gas law, one using the amount of gas in moles and the other utilizing the gas mass. According to this law, a gas cannot have a temperature above absolute zero without having a pressure greater than zero. This is because the product of pressure times volume, P times V, defines the kinetic energy of a gas since pressure times volume has units of joule. In the troposphere, air temperature decreases with altitude because it's controlled by pressure, which drops exponentially with height. The temperature decrease with altitude is known in atmospheric physics as adiabatic lapse rate. The word adiabatic means a change of the gas kinetic energy and temperature without gain or loss of heat from or to the environment. In an adiabatic process, the gas temperature changes solely as a function of a change in the internal gas pressure. An adiabatic process that is fully reversible is called isentropic, which means a constant entropy process. The observed vertical drop of air temperature in the troposphere driven by a pressure decrease with height is close to an isentropic process, although not completely equal to it. To understand what controls the altitude of a temperature layer in the troposphere, we need first to know why atmospheric pressure decreases with elevation. The reason is a necessary condition called hydrostatic equilibrium. What does it mean? In order for an atmosphere not to collapse at the surface due to gravity or be quickly dispersed into space due to the outward push of air pressure, there must be a large-scale balance between the downward pull of air masses by gravity and the outwardly directed force of air pressure. This balance, which represents a universal feature of planetary atmospheres enabling their existence, is known as hydrostatic equilibrium and mathematically defined by this differential equation. In plain language, it means that the vertical change of pressure, the PdZ, at any height, z, must equal the negative product of air density, rho, at that altitude and the gravitational acceleration, g. The derivation of this equation is straightforward and can be found in online educational videos and science texts. Hence, we will not discuss it here. How does equation 1 explain the pressure decrease with height? Understanding this and the relationship between pressure and temperature in the atmosphere requires some math, so please bear with me for a moment. Since density rho in equation 1 is the mass of air per unit volume, we can replace it with its equivalent from the ideal gas law, where T is the air temperature, M is the molar mass of air, and R is the universal gas constant. For Earth's atmosphere, M equals 0 0.029 kilograms per mole. This substitution leads to equation 3. The latter can be rearranged in a form that can be integrated vertically, yielding equation 4. Expressing the temperature at an altitude z as a linear function of the surface temperature T0 and a lapse rate L produces equation 5. Replacing T in equation 4 with its equivalent from equation 5 and integrating over a range of pressures and altitudes yields equation 6a where P0 is the pressure at the surface and P sub z is the pressure at an altitude z above the surface. The solution to equation 6a is equation 6b. Upon taking anti-logarithm on both sides of equation 6b, we arrive at the barometric formula equation 7, describing an exponential decrease of atmospheric pressure with altitude for a non-zero lapse rate L. If the lapse rate is zero, that is, if the air temperature does not change with altitude, which is not the case in reality, then equation 4 has the following solution, which is equation 8. This equation shows that the exponential drop of pressure with height is a consequence of the hydrostatic equilibrium requirement and not caused by the rate of temperature change with altitude. This is a key conclusion since it implies that the observed negative lapse rate in the troposphere is a result of a temperature dependence on pressure and the decrease of pressure with height. Since the vertical temperature profile of the troposphere is nearly isentropic, the dependence of temperature on pressure can be approximated by the potential temperature equation, also known as Poisson's relation, derived from the adiabatic form of the first law of thermodynamics in the ideal gas law. In equation 9, C sub P is the specific heat capacity of air at constant pressure. 
For the Earth's atmosphere, the exponent term equals 0 0.286. Equation 9 describes the atmospheric temperature T as a function of pressure P, provided that the surface reference values T0 and P0 are known. Strictly speaking, this formula is valid for dry air under neutral stability conditions. Since the Earth's atmosphere contains water vapor, which transports latent heat from the surface to higher altitudes where it condenses, the troposphere is thermodynamically in a somewhat stable condition on average. This is why the observed environmental lapse rate of minus 0.6 degree per kilometer is smaller than the dry adiabatic lapse rate of 9.8 degree per kilometer predicted by the Poisson's relation. As a result, equation 9 underestimates the temperature at any given pressure level in the real troposphere. However, such a minor detail does not invalidate the general relationship between temperature and pressure described by this fundamental formula. To recap, there are two fundamental equations explaining the vertical temperature profile in the troposphere. The Poisson's relation, which describes adiabatic effects of pressure on the temperature of dry air, and can serve as an approximation to the pressure-temperature relationship in the real troposphere, and the barometric formula, which predicts the pressure at altitude Z as a function of surface temperature, vertical lapse rate, and gravity. Notice that the Poisson's relation does not predict the effect of surface pressure, P0, on surface temperature, T0, since these are input parameters to the equation. We will discuss the dependence of the surface temperature on surface pressure in the context of a different model later on in this presentation. Taken together, these two equations imply that changing a temperature altitude in the troposphere requires shifting of the height of a corresponding pressure level. The barometric formula can be solved for Z to obtain an equation describing the dependence of a pressure altitude on thermodynamic variables. That's how this new equation looks like. As illustrated by the 3D plot on the right, the altitude of a pressure level P sub Z is proportional to surface temperature T0 and increases non-linearly with total surface pressure P0 provided that the lapse rate is fixed. A pressure altitude is also negatively impacted by gravity, meaning that a lower gravity implies a higher altitude for a pressure level. Note that this equation does not contain any variables quantifying the infrared opacity or murkiness of the atmosphere as stated by Professor Pierre Humbert. In fact, radiative properties of gases did not enter the derivation of the barometric formula at any step. Hence, to raise the altitude of a temperature level in the troposphere, one must do one of three things. A increase the surface temperature T0 either diabatically by reducing the cloud albedo and allowing more solar energy to be absorbed by the planet, or adiabatically by increasing the total surface pressure. We'll discuss the latter mechanism in details later in this presentation. B, increase the total surface pressure P0 by boosting the atmospheric mass through mantle degassing, for example. As pointed out above, this will also lead to higher surface temperatures and C, decrease the planet's gravity, which is not practically feasible. These fundamental thermodynamic equations also indicate that the altitude of a pressure-temperature level in the troposphere is a consequence that is an effect of the energy content of the climate system determined by solar heating and atmospheric pressure, and not a controller of surface temperatures. This conclusion prompts the question, if standard atmospheric thermodynamics does not support it, where did the EG mechanism claimed by the greenhouse theory come from? It turns out that the raising of Earth's effective radiating level by an increased atmospheric infrared opacity as a surface warming mechanism resulting from heightened concentrations of greenhouse gases was first proposed as a thought experiment 120 years ago by Dr. Niels Ekholm, a research meteorologist from Sweden and a close friend of Svante Arrhenius. Professor Arrhenius is now considered the father of the modern greenhouse theory. Ekholm was one of the early adamant believers in anthropogenic climate control who thought that humanity could prevent the arrival of a new ice age through regulation of industrial carbon emissions. He also believed that the CO2-caused warming was beneficial to Earth. Eholm was a member of the British Royal Meteorological Society and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. 
In 1901, Niels Ekholm published a paper in the Journal of the British Royal Meteorological Society entitled On the Variations of the Climate of the Geological and Historical Past and Their Causes. In it, he introduced, among other things, the term greenhouse effect to describe the warming action of the atmosphere on the Earth's surface as he incorrectly assumed that both the atmosphere and glass greenhouses trap radiant heat. We now know that glass greenhouses keep a warm interior by impeding the convective heat exchange with the environment and that they do not trap thermal radiation. On pages 19 and 20 of this paper, Ekholm describes what is now known as an enhanced greenhouse effect, a putative warming caused by an increased atmospheric infrared opacity which supposedly affects the surface temperature by pushing the Earth's effective radiating layer higher up in the atmosphere. The mechanism claimed by Professor Ray Perehumbert in the interview we saw earlier is virtually identical to what Niels Ekholm proposed 120 years ago. Quote, The radiation from the Earth into space does not go on directly from the ground, but on average from a layer of the atmosphere having a considerable height above sea level. The height of that layer depends on the thermal quality of the atmosphere and will vary with that quality. The greater is the absorbing power of the air for heat rays emitted from the ground, the higher will that layer be. But the higher the layer, the lower is its temperature relative to that of the ground, and as the radiation from the layer into space is the less, the lower its temperature is, it follows that the ground will be hotter the higher the radiating layer is. End of quote. Also, quite interestingly, the incorrect notion expressed by Ekholm in 1901 that the decrease of tropospheric temperature with altitude is caused by convection is still being repeated to this day by climate scientists, as we heard from Professor Per Humbert. In reality, the negative temperature lapse rate in the troposphere is caused by the vertical pressure gradient and the dependence of temperature on air pressure. Convection is simply enabled by the pressure gradient, lapse rate, and gravity. It is important to remember that Eckholm introduced this EGE mechanism as a pure conjecture not supported by any observed data or a validated physical theory. His reasoning was likely shaped by the belief that the atmosphere warms our planet by retarding the rate of surface energy loss to space. This belief, first formulated by Fourier in 1827, is still at the core of the modern greenhouse theory as explained by Professor Pierre Humbert. To this day, the EGE mechanism has remained speculative and, as we demonstrated earlier, it is at odds with standard atmospheric thermodynamics. It has become an established science through mere repetition by generations of scientists after Ekholm, aided by a biased representation of atmospheric creative processes in computer models starting in 1950s with the work of the physicist Gilbert Plass. The EGE mechanism is an example of an incorrect physical concept gaining a wide acceptance through expert consensus rather than the power of empirical evidence. Before presenting our alternative concept of the atmospheric greenhouse effect that resolves physical inconsistencies of the radio greenhouse theory, it will be informative to examine a popular tabletop demonstration purported to show the heat trapping properties of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere. This is the so-called greenhouse effect in a bottle experiment, frequently used to teach students about how the anthropogenic global warming is supposed to work. Here is an example. Do you want to see how it works? Yes, please. What are we doing here today, Mercy? I'm going to show you the greenhouse effect. So first of all, we're going to take our two thermometers and keep them out for about three minutes so they'll show us the accurate room temperature. Miana, can you look at the thermometer and tell me what's the temperature today? 20, 21, 22, 25. It's 25. Now we're going to put one thermometer in one of the bottles. There's a hole in the bottle. Yes, I made a hole in the cork so that the thermometer can pass through easily. In the second bottle, add two tablespoons of baking soda. Two. And 60 ml of vinegar. We have to do the next step very quickly and pour this in carefully. I should cover it up. 
I can see bubbles. We have to seal this quickly so that no carbon dioxide escapes. The reaction between vinegar and baking soda results in the production of carbon dioxide. I'm gonna take the two sun lamps and place them about four inches away from each bottle. Why do we use sun lamps? To heat up our bubbles just like the sun heats the earth. Wow, they actually look like the sun. It's getting hot here. It is indeed. We've kept the two bottles in front of the sun lamps for about five minutes. What do you notice looking at the thermometers? This one is 35, this one is 28. So the bottle with carbon dioxide is showing a higher temperature as compared to the one with just air. But why is that, Mercy? Even air has carbon dioxide. The air in the bottles cannot circulate to the rest of the room. It stays in the bottle and under the light of the lamp, it gets warmer and warmer. The bottle with the carbon dioxide traps even more heat and warms up even faster than the room air which contains only a trace amount of carbon dioxide. A similar trapping of heat happens in the Earth's atmosphere. Sunlight passes through the atmosphere and warms the Earth's surface. Greenhouse gases trap the heat radiating out from the surface of the planet and this process is called the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect makes the earth warmer. The greenhouse gases trap the heat of the sun. You got it right there. Let's analyze this experiment. First, let's answer the question, what made the bottle filled with carbon dioxide warming up more than the control bottle containing normal air? Well, the CO2 bottle absorbed more infrared radiation from the sun lamps than the air-filled bottle. This part of their explanation was correct. Since gas volume is constrained by the rigid walls of the bottles, gas expansion and convective heat exchange with the surrounding environment were hampered in both cases. But because CO2 absorbs more thermal energy than air, it also expands stronger than air. As a result, the gas pressure in the CO2 bottle rises to a higher level than the pressure in the air-filled bottle. This boosts the temperature in the CO2 bottle above that of the air-filled bottle. However, this does not demonstrate a heat-trapping property of carbon dioxide. Here is why. Gas systems operating under a fixed volume, as in this experiment, are called isochoric in thermodynamics. Their behavior is described by the Gay-Lussac law, which states that in a constant volume system, pressure is proportional to temperature. One can also state that in isochoric system, temperature is a linear function of pressure. However, the atmosphere is not an isochoric system because its volumetric expansion is not constrained by a rigid barrier. The atmosphere operates as a constant pressure system, also known as isobaric system, because the surface pressure is determined by gravity and the atmospheric mass above a unit surface area. Isobaric systems are governed by Charles' law, which states that under a constant pressure, gas volume is proportional to temperature. One can observe Charles' law at work in Earth's atmosphere by examining the latitudinal variation of the height of the tropopause. Tropopause is the altitude where vertical convection induced by surface heating runs out of energy and ceases to push the cloud deck any higher while at the same time making the air temperature stop decreasing with elevation. That is, the elapse rate becomes zero in the tropopause. The tropopause height is an indicator of atmospheric volume. In the tropics and subtropics, the tropopause is located at 16 to 18 kilometer altitude, while in the polar regions, it is found at 8 to 10 kilometer altitude. This suggests that the atmospheric volume is nearly twice as big in the tropics as it is at the poles. That's because the solar heating is much stronger at lower latitudes than it is in the polar region. Air parcels heated at the surface rise and cool adiabatically in the free atmosphere by expanding into lower pressure levels aloft. However, a gas trapped in a bottle cannot cool through expansion. Impeding convective heat exchange and adiabatic expansion makes the results from this bottle experiment inapplicable to the real atmosphere since bottle gases represent a completely different kind of a thermodynamic system governed by a different law compared to the gas system of an open atmosphere. If a CO2 parcel would be allowed to freely expand when heated by infrared radiation, 
its final temperature will be no different from or perhaps even cooler than that of an unconstrained parcel of normal air absorbing even lesser amount of infrared radiation. Therefore, this battle experiment demonstrates nothing more than the well-known Gay-Lussac law of thermodynamics and does not provide an illustration of radiant heat trapping by CO2 as claimed by the current theory. Another problem with the experiment shown in this video is that the greenhouse bottle contained over 80% carbon dioxide since it, it was capped immediately after pouring the vinegar that started the chemical reaction releasing CO2. The Earth's atmosphere currently only has about 0.04% carbon dioxide that is expected to rise perhaps to about 0.06% by the year 2100. Over the past 500 million years, atmospheric CO2 has not exceeded 0.25% or a quarter of a percent. The CO2 concentration in the experimental bottle is over 300 times higher than that. This makes a big difference in how much warmer the greenhouse bottle could get. If the control bottle contained a pre-industrial CO2 concentration of 0.028% and the greenhouse bottle was at the present CO2 level of 0.0415%, then even this constant volume experiment would likely have shown no measurable difference in temperatures between the two vessels. However, for some reason such experiments are not performed publicly. Finally, the animation at the end of the video showing infrared long-wave radiation from the Earth's surface bouncing off the upper atmosphere as if the latter were a mirror is physically completely incorrect. As discussed earlier, atmospheric gases cannot and do not reflect thermal radiation, and the upper atmosphere has no hard surface. Thus, the claimed trapping of radiant heat by trace gases in the atmosphere is impossible. To summarize, first, the current theory of the atmospheric greenhouse effect has its roots in a 19th century hypothesis proposed as a series of conjectures based on a limited amount of data and misinterpretations of experimental lab results. Amazingly, the fundamental premises of this theory have not changed since two famous papers published over 120 years ago, one by Professor Swanee Arrhenius in 1896 entitled On the Influence of Carbonic Acid in the Air Upon the Temperature of the Ground, and another by Dr. Niels Eckholm, a meteorologist and friend of Arrhenius, in 1901, entitled On the Variations of the Climate of the Geological and Historical Past and Their Causes. These papers introduced the following tenets that are still at the core of the modern greenhouse theory. A. Trace gases such as carbon dioxide and water vapor trap radiant heat in the atmosphere that is analogous to the heat trapping by glass greenhouses. B. Water vapor exerts a positive feedback that amplifies the warming effect of carbon dioxide. C. Carbon dioxide is the main driver of climate at any time scale, including during the ice ages. And D. An increased opacity of the atmosphere to infrared long-wave radiation due to a higher concentration of CO2 or water vapor would warm the Earth's surface by raising the effective radiating altitude of the planet, thus allowing the temperature lapse rate to be applied over a longer distance. Second, the fundamental premise of the greenhouse theory that the atmospheric thermal effect is due to impedance of surface infrared cooling to space by trace gases has no support in modern satellite observations. In fact, the very definition of the greenhouse effect as an absorption of outgoing infrared flux by the atmosphere not only fails to explain the 90-degree global atmospheric thermal effect at the surface, but also yields physically nonsensical results at the poles, such as a zero or negative greenhouse effect over central Antarctica. Satellite data show that the flux-based definition of the greenhouse effect has no relationship to the latitudinal atmospheric warming of the surface. Third, the infrared back radiation assumed to drive the atmospheric thermal effect also shows no meaningful relationship with the degree of atmospheric thermal enhancement across latitudes. Fourth, the assumption that repeated absorption and re-emission of thermal radiation by greenhouse gases somehow increases the overall internal kinetic energy of the lower troposphere is not supported by either thermodynamic theory or observations. 
The attempt to explain observed near-surface thermal fluxes which exceed 340 watts per square meter with the measured absorbed total solar flux of 240 watts per square meter using only radiative transfer theory leads to violation of the energy conservation law, also known as the first law of thermodynamics. Hence, such an explanation must be physically incorrect. Fifth, the proposed self-heating mechanism through recycling of infrared long-wave radiation between surface and the atmosphere adopted by the greenhouse theory violates the second law of thermodynamics, also known as the law of increasing entropy. That's because a physical body cannot increase its temperature by absorbing infrared long-wave radiation from another object that has previously been heated by the body's own thermal emission. Sixth, there is no physical evidence that the atmosphere acts as a thermal insulator to the Earth's surface as assumed for nearly 200 years, because thermal insulation requires materials that have either very low thermal conductivity and thus retard convective heat exchange, or a very low infrared absorptivity and high infrared reflectivity that deflects thermal radiation. These properties are opposite to those of greenhouse gases, which is why such gases have never been employed as thermal insulators in engineering applications. We might now ask the question, what is the solution to the insurmountable physical problems facing the greenhouse theory? Fortunately, a solution exists in the form of an alternative full-fledged concept based on modern observations that explains the atmospheric thermal effect in climate change in a whole new way. First, we address the question, what is the physical nature of the atmospheric thermal effect, or ATE for short? To find out, we adopted a top-down analytical approach that has not previously been attempted in climate science. Our method rests on three key premises. A, the mechanisms governing Earth's climate are not unique to our planet, but operate on other solar system bodies with rocky surfaces as well. This premise stems from a fundamental postulate in physics that natural laws are invariant with respect to space-time. B. If the above is true, then the Earth's long-term global surface temperature must be a part of a cosmic continuum of planetary temperatures spanning the solar system and controlled by a common set of drivers. And C. Finding the correct functional form of this continuum should reveal the true cause of the atmospheric thermal effect on Earth and other planets. We gathered planetary data from numerous published sources. This slide shows the planets and moons in the solar system for which sufficient data currently exists to be included in our analysis. We selected three planets and three moons covered by quality data representing a broad range of radiative regimes, atmospheric conditions, and thermal environments. For example, the solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere ranges from 1.5 watts per square meter at Triton to about 2600 watts per square meter at Venus. The long-term global surface temperature varies from 39 Kelvin on Triton to nearly 700 Kelvin on Venus. Planetary atmospheres cover a large continuum from the Moon's airless environment to the massive atmosphere of Venus exerting a surface pressure of 9,300,000 pascals. The spectrum of atmospheric compositions is equally impressive. In searching for drivers that can explain the variation of global surface temperatures across these diverse bodies, we decided to let the data tell a story rather than employing a preconceived theory in the analysis that could bias our conclusions. Hence, we applied a classical technique called dimensional analysis, or DA for short, designed to infer physically meaningful relationships from actual measurements without having a theoretical knowledge about the phenomenon. DA has been successfully employed in fluid mechanics, physics, and other fields of science, as well as in various areas of engineering for about 200 years. It's a proven method for deriving physical relationships that are independent of measurement units in accordance with the fact that laws of nature operate using dimensionless quantities. Our dimensional analysis reduced the large number of planetary input parameters to a few dimensionless variables while suggesting 12 possible models shown on this slide that had to be investigated for viability through a nonlinear regression analysis. On these plots, 
the horizontal axis show dimensionless products composed of greenhouse gas densities and partial pressures, solar irradiance, and total surface atmospheric pressure and near-surface air density. Vertical axis represent the atmospheric thermal enhancement, or ATE, defined as a ratio of a body's observed global surface temperature under the current atmosphere to the body's hypothetical global surface temperature in the absence of either greenhouse gases or an atmosphere. Dimensional analysis yielded this temperature ratio as a measure of the atmospheric thermal effect. Out of all models, only model 12 produced a very tight and highly accurate relationship describing ATE as a function of total surface atmospheric pressure, P. The second best model in terms of a curve fit was model 1, which employed partial densities and partial pressures of greenhouse gases as predictors. A comparison of models 1 and 12 in this figure using linear vertical axis shows that model 12 was vastly superior to model 1. The rest of the regression models did not produce any meaningful relationships. Note that the plot of model 12 uses logarithmic axis. Upon taking anti-logarithm, we arrive at this curve describing the response of the atmospheric thermal effect to surface atmospheric pressure across the solar system on a linear scale. This represents the core of our discovery regarding the physical nature of the atmospheric effect. The vertical axis is the relative atmospheric thermal enhancement, abbreviated as rate, defined as a ratio of two long-term global surface temperatures, one measured under the current atmosphere, T sub Sb, and another estimated in the absence of an atmosphere, T sub Na. The no atmosphere temperature T sub Na is calculated using the new airless integral spherical formula by Volokhin and Les, 2014, which has been verified against NASA data for the Moon, Europa, and Callisto. Therefore, this temperature ratio quantifies the degree, in relative terms, to which the presence of an atmosphere warms the surface. Note that the absolute atmospheric thermal effect is the arithmetic difference between T sub SB and T sub NA. The horizontal axis is the observed mean surface atmospheric pressure on a planetary body, the only variable in our analysis that accurately predicted the relative atmospheric thermal effect over a vast range of physical conditions. While the relative atmospheric thermal enhancement only depends on surface air pressure, the absolute atmospheric thermal effect depends on both pressure and total solar irradiance or distance to the sun. As discussed in our 2017 paper to be presented in a minute, this curve possesses the mathematical features of a new planetary level microphysical law, including accuracy, robustness, and a broad scope of validity. It places the Earth's baseline temperature in the context of a cosmic continuum of climate drivers, which is something that the relative greenhouse theory has not been able to achieve. For those who are mathematically inclined, this slide shows the formula for calculating the baseline average global surface temperature of planets and moons as a product of two terms, the no atmosphere temperature T sub Na, which is basically a function of solar irradiance or the planet's distance to the sun, in a dimensionless double exponential term quantifying the relative thermal enhancement of the atmosphere, which is a function of the mean surface air pressure. The second term describes the red curve we discussed on the previous slide. The expression for the average airless global temperature, T sub Na, was derived by analytical integration of the stefan boltzmann radiation law over a sphere, as described by Volokhin and Rules, 2014. This semi-empirical equation reveals that the long-term baseline temperature of a planetary body, T sub Sb, is only a function of two drivers, the top of the atmosphere solar irradiance and total surface atmospheric pressure, and that atmospheric composition plays no role in determining the planet's temperature. Hence, the so-called greenhouse gases are thermodynamically not different from any other gases such as nitrogen and oxygen, and their contribution to a planet's baseline surface temperature is only through their partial pressures and not through their infrared radiative properties. The macro-level pressure-temperature relationship across planetary bodies discovered by our research has fundamental implications for the current climate theory and our understanding of climate drivers. These are as follows. First, the atmospheric thermal effect is a form of compression heating caused by air pressure that is independent of atmospheric composition. Pressure as a force applied over a unit area enhances the energy received from the sun, since energy is a function of force, 
and the kinetic energy of a gas measured in joules is defined by the product of pressure times volume according to the gas law. In other words, the atmosphere warms the surface adiabatically, not radiatively as believed for nearly 200 years. Second, the atmospheric infrared back radiation is a byproduct of the atmospheric thermal effect, and as such, it does not drive Earth's climate. The latter is controlled by the sun and total air pressure, which is a function of atmospheric mass and gravity. This means that the radiative greenhouse effect does not exist in reality. The confusion originated from the fact that the downwelling infrared radiation is easily measurable and has been measured since the 19th century, while the adiabatic pressure-induced heating is hidden as an underlying cause and requires a cross-planetary analysis like ours to detect. The adiabatic compression heating of the surface and the lower troposphere explains why the flux of atmospheric infrared back radiation on Earth is 42% larger than the total absorbed solar flux by the planet. On Venus, the discrepancy between these fluxes is extreme due to a 93 bar atmospheric pressure. The infrared back radiation at the Venusian surface exceeds 12,500 watts per square meter, while the absorbed solar flux is only 65 watts per square meter. The atmosphere does not trap radiant heat. It adiabatically enhances the absorbed solar energy through the force of air pressure, which is a mechanism deeply misunderstood in climate science. Third, contrary to the claim made by the greenhouse theory, the Earth's climate has no tipping points, since the baseline global temperature of a planet is a smooth function of solar luminosity, distance to the sun, and total atmospheric pressure. Fourth, Non-condensing trace gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide have no measurable impact on the global surface temperature due to their minuscule partial pressures in the atmosphere. Fifth, human carbon emissions cannot in principle affect global climate because they do not alter atmospheric pressure in any significant way. Sixth, the bulk of planetary albedo is a byproduct or consequence of the climate system and does not control the global surface temperature. However, a small fraction of the albedo is modulated by solar activity and impacts planetary temperature on decadal to centennial timescales. We'll address this topic again later. It should be pointed out that the current climate theory does not consider direct thermodynamic effects of atmospheric pressure on global temperature. In the greenhouse concept, pressure only impacts surface temperature through the broadening of infrared absorption bands of greenhouse gases. Thus, the role of pressure as a force controlling the temperature of a gas dictated by the gas law has mostly been ignored in climate science. Our discovery draws the researchers' attention back to this fundamental thermodynamic driver. The pressure-temperature relationship discovered in our analysis of planetary data is qualitatively quite similar in terms of shape to the pressure-temperature functions known in other physical systems as illustrated by this slide. This gives credence to the notion that our empirical model describes a macro-level physical reality. Our discovery about the physical nature of the atmospheric thermal effect, currently known under the incorrect name greenhouse effect, is described in this 2017 paper, which I strongly recommend to everyone interested in the technical details of this new climate science paradigm. The paper is available as an open access online. You may notice that the regression coefficients of our empirical pressure temperature model presented in this video differ slightly from those listed in the paper. That's a result of using more recent and better baseline temperature data for some planetary bodies such as Venus, Titan, and Earth. Although the direct effect of pressure on gas temperature is fundamental to classical thermodynamics and a part of standard atmospheric physics, Pressure is not an explicit component of the current climate theory exclusively focused on the purative radiative greenhouse effect. As a result, climate scientists do not consider air pressure to be a driver of surface temperature except via its effect on the broadening of gas absorption lines in the infrared spectrum, which is not a thermodynamic phenomenon. Hence, it might be informative to discuss some examples illustrating the critical role of pressure in determining atmospheric temperatures. The most common effect of pressure on air temperature is the observed cooling with increasing altitude in the troposphere. The decrease of air pressure with height is the reason for the drop of ambient temperature at a rate of about 6 degrees Celsius per kilometer as one ascends in elevation. 
This explains why tall mountain peaks located even at the equator, such as Mount Kilimanjaro, are cold enough to support permanent glaciers, while their foothills host lush subtropical flora and fauna. The temperature drop with elevation is called adiabatic lapse rate. The word adiabatic means changing the internal kinetic energy and temperature of a gas parcel without gain or loss of heat, that is, without a heat exchange with the surrounding environment. Adiabatic heating and cooling are only possible through changes in the internal gas pressure. Thus, the negative adiabatic lapse rate observed in the troposphere is the result of a temperature change with pressure and the decrease of pressure with height. In mathematical terms, dt dz equals dt dp times dp dz. The vertical convection in the Earth's atmosphere is nearly an adiabatic process since air parcels heated by the surface cool mostly by rising up and expanding into lower pressure levels aloft. While the decrease of pressure with altitude is the reason for the existence of a lapse rate in the troposphere, the magnitude of this lapse rate depends strongly on the intensity of solar heating, atmospheric moisture, and wind speed. Standard dry air has a lapse rate of minus 9.8 Celsius per kilometer, while saturated moist air cools at a rate of about 5 degrees Celsius per kilometer. The environmental lapse rate usually falls between these two extremes. Intense solar heating during summertime can cause a super adiabatic lapse rate that is greater than minus 10 degree per kilometer. Some climate scientists claim that the lapse rate is caused by radiative properties of greenhouse gases, which is thermodynamically completely false. Perhaps the most striking example of pressure heating in the atmosphere are high pressure systems called omega blocks or heat domes that are formed by a wavy and meandering jet stream. One such event recently occurred over the Pacific Northwest. A high-pressure system got lodged for several days over Washington State and British Columbia, Canada at the end of June of 2021, causing a record-smashing heat wave with surface temperatures soaring over 43 degrees Celsius or 110 degrees Fahrenheit in most places. The town of Lytton in western Canada, nested between mountain ranges, experienced little temperatures of 49.4 degrees Celsius or 121 degrees Fahrenheit on June 30th. In a few hours, the excessive heat stripped trees of their green leaves and ignited fires that consumed 90% of the small town. This incredible heat was caused by a sinking air that the high-pressure system pushed down from higher altitudes and adiabatically compressed near the surface. Another contributing factor were the easterly catabatic winds generated by the high-pressure system due to a clockwise rotation of the air that came down the mountain slope and also got heated by compression. Some commentators rushed to link this rare heat wave to anthropogenic climate change, but the reality is that atmospheric CO2 played no role in this event. Research conducted after 2017 led to the expansion of the Nikolov Zeller or NZ model. Using latitudinal thermal observations from several planets and moons provided by NASA, we developed equations for estimating the long term baseline temperatures at five key latitudes in addition to the global mean. Latitudinal temperatures were coupled to the average global temperature via thermal gradients that were found to be accurately predictable by the average near-surface atmospheric density, which in turn, according to the gas law, is a function of total surface atmospheric pressure and the global average temperature. The ENZI model was also extended to include the effect of cloud albedo variations on the global surface temperature. These augmentations and their implications for a new understanding of the drivers of Earth's paleoclimate and modern climate change were presented in two separate videos at the 101st meeting of the American Meteorological Society in January of 2021. The videos can be viewed on YouTube at a channel called Truth and Insights. This slide shows screenshots from the two videos. To find them quickly online, please Google the titles listed under the screenshots. These videos complement the information presented here by providing a more comprehensive picture of an emerging climate science paradigm that has the potential to solve the current climate crisis through a new enlightenment. We conclude this presentation by highlighting some principal differences between the greenhouse hypothesis originated in the 19th century and the new Nikolov Zeller climate concept based on a planetary temperature model derived from modern observations obtained throughout the solar system 
via a robust mathematical analysis. The greenhouse theory assumes that the Earth's atmosphere raises the global surface temperature by 33 degrees Kelvin, while Nikola von Zeller found the atmospheric thermal effect to be around 90 degrees Kelvin, or 2.7 times stronger than assumed for nearly 100 years. The ENZI model fully explains this thermal enhancement in the context of a cosmic continuum defined by six planetary bodies spanning the breadth of the solar system. The greenhouse theory claims that the atmosphere reduces the surface infrared cooling to space through trapping of radiant heat by greenhouse gases. Nikola von Zeller discovered that the atmosphere heats the surface adiabatically through a gravitational compression of air. The resulting air pressure enhances the energy received from the sun by adding force to the gas system, a mechanism that is misunderstood and ignored in the current climate science. Since the atmosphere is a convective fluid operating in an open system, it cannot and does not trap heat. The greenhouse hypothesis argues that the global surface temperature is sensitive to changes in greenhouse gas concentrations. Hence, human carbon emissions can impact climate. Nikola von Zeller found that the global baseline temperature of planetary bodies is independent of atmospheric composition. Therefore, non-condensing trace gases have no measurable influence on climate due to their small partial pressures. The greenhouse concept regards atmospheric carbon dioxide as a key driver of climate on all time scales. The NZ concept identified different drivers at different time scales. Over decades to centuries, the global climate is controlled by small fluctuations of cloud albedo around a baseline induced directly or indirectly by sun's magnetic activity. On time scales of thousands to millions of years, variations in total atmospheric mass and surface air pressure change the planet's global baseline temperature and meridional temperature gradients, creating the polar amplification phenomenon observed in the geological records. Next time someone asks you to reduce your carbon footprint to prevent climate change, point them to the science presented in this video. Organizations such as CO2 Living propagandize the saving of Earth's climate as a noble cause that requires drastic changes in our personal lifestyle ranging from driving less and unplugging our electrical devices to stop eating meat and replacing our laundry dryers with a line drying of clothes. This is a vivid example of how a physically wrong science theory can unnecessarily complicate our lives by giving rise to false moral values. The Earth's climate is not in human control since it is not affected by invisible trace gases and we don't need to sacrifice our economic development and standard of living trying to stop climate change, which is unstoppable. However, we need to preserve the cleanness of our environment for it to sustain life and civilization growth while realizing that pollution and climate change are separate issues and that carbon dioxide is not a pollutant but a life-giving gas.